we're going to get started right now with news you can use. Uh, it's basically all bad news, except for there's one piece of good news. Let's, let's just kind of run down through some quick numbers here. First of all, mortgage rates today plateaued at 7.22% interest rate for a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. That's horrendously high. It's the highest it's been in years. And uh, obviously that's, you guys know all the issues that we've talked about in past news you can use and some of the other articles and things we put together, uh, how that's adversely affecting the housing market. Now, keep in mind, there are, as we talked on the last call and last week's calls, there are a number of workarounds for that. So if you haven't uh, gotten up to speed on those, I would suggest looking at last Tuesday's call and again on the Sunday all call that we just did. Uh, and we can kind of go through that in detail, but I haven't to go through it today. Um, let's talk a little bit about home sales. Home sales last month, uh, now the month of September, were down for the eighth month in a row nationwide. Now, keep in mind, and this brings up kind of an interesting point, uh, that's based on MLS data. So in other words, listed properties that go through the multiple listing services, and it's based on the National Real Estate Association numbers. I don't believe those numbers are uh, complete and accurate. I don't think they count for all the sales because what it does exclude is anything that's done direct between a seller and ourselves as investors that goes direct to a transactional engineer, coordinator, like an escrow company, an attorney, those kinds of things. Those aren't included in the total. And I believe that we represent, as investors, we represent a larger percentage of the market than uh, the, the common news media would let you believe. Because once again, they're taking their data, data from the National Association of Realtors. For example, in a couple of the markets that we're in, uh, you know, we've gone from fourth or fifth position in terms of buyers uh, to, in some cases, the top position. We're buying more than other people are buying, uh, you know, any agent is selling that kind of thing. We're representing, in other words, out of a particular agent, we may represent 80% of their business now instead of only 10 to 20% like we were. So, and a lot of that stuff, uh, if we're not going through the MLS, if it's a direct transaction between a private seller and ourselves as investors, it's not being recorded in the data. So that leads one to at least ponder the question of, are we headed for a crash or is this a plateau? Um, you know, where are we getting to the point where we're plateauing? Now I've advocated that we're actually in a perfect storm right now. I still believe that went through again numbers today and yesterday. Um, and, you know, it, it, let me just run through the, the kind of general metrics so you understand what I'm talking about. There are actually more sellers out there than the market would lead you to believe because there are a lot of sellers that would love to sell, but they feel that because prices are dropping, they don't want to get on board that train yet and, and lower their price. Or they feel like, hey, I've got a 3% mortgage. If I sell the house now, I'd love to move up. But if I move up, I'm going to get a 7.22% mortgage. And I don't want to do that. Those people are still wanting to sell. They are active sellers in their own mind, even if they are not listed uh, until an investor comes to them and, and explains how we can do that by eliminating high interest rates and inflation in the factors. And so um, that, that's one aspect. Number two is buyer demand is still built up and has been built up since the pandemic. A lot of buyers got priced out of the market because prices jumped too fast and they couldn't keep up with the multiple bid situation the last two years, or at least uh, the last uh, year and a half of the last two years. And they're still out there. They're willing buyers, they wanna do it, but now, they're facing that 7.22% interest rate. And they're like, I can't afford that anymore. Uh, you know, I can't, I can, I, I don't mind paying this for the house. They've come to the realization that the house they wanted, which was 400,000 in 19 is now 600, albeit now it's probably 580 or 570 or 560, but they can't, uh, you know, they've come to the realization, okay, I got to pay that for a house. Great. I've got the deposit. I got the down payment. Great. But I can't afford the monthly now because 7.22% is obviously two and a half times 2.8% where it was one year ago. So there are actual buyers out there, uh, tons of them who want to do these things. And there are now foreign buyers back in the market with all cash. And then there are a number of, there's a huge segment of the market that everybody ignores that is the landlord business. So in other words, 
people who have two or three rentals in an area, they want to add to that. They see prices dropping. They want to get in quick. They want to buy while they can, while there's some opportunity for product available. Uh, so if your house is in decent shape, you'll get a lot of times cash offers still today, but from local real estate uh, landlords, basically the, the, the own and rent crowd, not necessarily the Burr people, the buy, uh, rehabilitate, rent, refinance and repeat guys, but people who I'll pay full price uh, because the house is ready to go and the demand for rentals is very high and the return on rentals is high. So there's still people out there buying at that level. In fact, that's actually probably up from where it was. So a lot of sellers, a lot of buyers. And then the third factor that nobody really focuses on is these lenders are, they've got tons of money. They've got all kinds of money and they're not, you know, demand for loans, traditional loans is way down. And so these guys don't have a place to put their money out. So money is getting paid off. It's coming in and they're sitting on big piles of money and they're making zero return when you know, they could be making 7.22%. And so the the difference between having a pile of money, let's say a billion dollars sitting there when interest rates are 2.8 and you're making no loans versus 7.2 and you're making no loans, it's a huge difference. So you're losing three and a half times uh, what you would have lost a year ago with unused money, but yet now there's more money where they used to have a billion, now they have 2 billion or 3 billion. And so they're cutting deals. They're they're going below the, the traditional conforming, non-conforming loans to put deals together. And so they're looking to us, the investor community. They're pushing money out the door uh, to get it used in the investor community. And they're looking at other ways to, to do something because money that has no return is actually a loss. If it's below inflation, it's actually a loss for these folks. So um high amount of sellers high amount of buyers and a lot of cash if you know how to put all that stuff together and we've got too short of a window here to talk about that tonight but in, in our course we teach that kind of thing how you take all of those factors put them together and thread that needle to hook them all together and be able to put together a satisfactory transaction for everybody and there's ways to totally eliminate high interest and inflation from uh, the factor and when you do that, uh, you can make some pretty good money. So we see it in our businesses. Uh, we're averaging something like eight uh, leads a day on Facebook with a $25 ad spend, uh, whereas it used to be one or maybe two. So, and the leads are good. They're high quality, they're high demand. Uh, they're people who want to sell and they want to sell now. They've got the same situations that all traditional buyers have death, divorce, taxes, bankruptcy, job loss, medical issues, family issues, job issues, having to move. Those things keep happening in all economies, good or bad. So uh, we're, in a, we're in a perfect storm. If you know how to take advantage of it, there is a lot of money to be made. So that's, I mean, that's negative news. It's also good news. Um, one little thing that I wanna throw in there, a little tidbit that I read today, uh, the first person that will live to be a thousand years old has recently been born, is born this year is what the projections are. And they have developed the science now uh, to tweak telomeres and part of the, the DNA sequencing code, the ends of the DNA strands. They've been able to do that to keep them from splicing. So uh, there is the possibility, uh, I won't see it in my lifetime, but somebody who was born in 2022 could live to th the year 3000, believe it or not. They have developed this ability. They've not tested it. It's probably 50 years, 60 years away from uh, being able to be used uh, on humans. And who knows if we'll be around still by then as a species. But uh, if we are, in, in, my, in my limited amount of research on this topic, it looks like you know, there's going to be long lifetimes. I remember when uh, my youngest was born, uh, they said, well, this is the first generation that the average lifespan will be 100. Um, and so, you know, now they're talking a thousand, thousand years old because they can tweak this technology. So I don't know how that's going to work or how it's going to look, but I thought that was kind of an interesting little tidbit to throw out there. So the first thousand year old person is not yet a member of the pipeline 
but maybe in 50 years, it will be. All right.